Hi, welcome to Politics for he People Who Hate Politics, episode 11 or so. Uh, I'm Lucy Steigerwald for this and for Liberty.me. And yeah, we're getting ready for uh, an exciting panel show with some new guests who have been haranguing to be my guests for what feels like months or years now. Um, first and least important, we have Joe, my brother. He's all right. Great Say to hi, be Joe. here. Yeah. Yeah, we know you love it so much. Um, we also have Andrew Carell, whose lower third went away, because he's uh. incompetent. Um, but he's also the editor-in-chief of Mediaite, and his hatred for all, everything and everyone warms my heart on at least <laughs> a weekly basis. Um, so thanks for coming, Andrew. It's an honor to commiserate in our hatred of everything. So, so, so glad. Um, and we also have Anthony Fisher, who is a producer for Reason TV, and he wrote and produced uh, the movie Sidewalk Traffic kind of recently. And I used to work with him, and that was fun. That was fun. Those were good times. <laughs> uh, yeah, for, for, for possibly the first time, I wonder if I've ever had a panel where I met everyone. No, you know what I have, because I've met Joe and Corey and Michelle, so that's a total lie. But often I don't have people I know in real life, and I like all these people. So we are going to start with, we're gonna, I'm going to talk to Anthony for a couple minutes, and then y'all can chime in uh, a, a little bit that, about his um, recent TV piece this week. It was a big, um, big little documentary thing about a disturbing um, DEA situation down in a little Texas town called Alpine. Um, and as I tweeted uh, halfway through it, I did yell out "What the fuck" without prompting or audience. So, um, Anthony, tell the good people about your story and why it's disturbing. Well, I, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on, and I'm glad to have given you a "What the fuck" moment because that was uh, the desired intention uh, for anyone watching this. Uh, it was also a uh, companion article to it where there's about 60% more what the fuck moments that could not be contained in a 10 minute documentary uh, but uh, basically uh, I, uh, I used to be a producer on the Fox Business show The Independence and I first came across this story then because um, it had made national news when Will Wheaton posted a strange bond document on his Tumblr that demanded that a woman basically incriminate herself and uh, recant statements saying that the DEA had abused her sister during a raid gone wrong in her tiny Texas smoke shop. And uh, I started making phone calls, and every time I made a phone call, the story got crazier and crazier. Um, and now that I'm back with reason, I'm able to do some uh, deeper investigative reporting. And I went down to Texas, and um, basically the story... Uh, uh, starts with uh, a 2014 DEA raid that was part of the Obama administration's Project Synergy Phase 2 where they were looking for people selling synthetic drugs who would then funnel them to Middle Eastern terrorist groups. Um, but this didn't really fit the profile. This was a young Jewish woman um, uh, who, and uh, the, 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 this town has about 5,000 people in it. About half of them are cops, uh, e either federally or locally or in training, and uh, everybody knows everybody, and this store had been raided uh, three times before in the previous two years, so there really was no reason for a militarized raid on it. Um, the raid went wrong. Uh, was, like, like I said, the, the, uh, her sister was uh, hit, you know, allegedly hit by um, a DEA agent with uh, the butt of a rifle. The DEA claims that unprovoked, this 90-pound woman kicked a, uh, a large male body armored, automatic weapon holding uh, DEA agent. Um, they raided a, a neighboring house um, without a warrant. Um, after the raid was over, they uh, intimidated a local journalist, um, basically out of her job. But before that, they got the ownership of the paper she wrote for to write a follow-up story that could have been essentially written by the district attorney's office um, and put her yeah, byline on it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that uh, is so, a lapdog press. Yeah, it's you. a, it, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a shame because there are a couple of really good reporters down there that were trying to do, just you know, honest reporting where they actually did give, equal, uh, maybe not equal time, but they definitely gave a voice to law enforcement and they took a skeptical glance at everyone involved. Um, and so basically, the uh, 
the uh, the holy shit punchline uh, of this story is that um, there's there's a there's a good reason to suspect that all of this may stem from a uh, previous sexual relationship between um, the woman who owns the store and the man who is now the district attorney. Um, when he when she first came to the town, it was about 11 years ago as a 18 year old college freshman, and uh, she got introduced to this older lawyer who uh, gave her a job and then seduced her. Uh, she blew him off. He kind of acted questionably after that for a while, and then, you know, ten years later, he's the district attorney, and suddenly, you know, she's indicted, and suddenly the DEA is kicking in her door, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, you, you, you can't say that it's a direct causation, but it definitely is enough to, to bring up a motive, and all of the, and you could definitely say that, um, it's hard to, hard to say what is worse, the crime or the cover-up, but there was a tremendous panicking cover-up by uh, law enforcement, especially this district attorney, and um, that's uh, that's a that's a that's a decent blow by blow of what uh, you can see in my uh, in my documentary and in my article. So, uh, what's the status um, of things now with with the woman? I mean, well, in terms of um, where does where does she stand now with um, being in, in in legal trouble? Well, she uh, the federal charges were dropped without prejudice because they didn't find a single thing, not even a chemical analog of a controlled substance, mm -hmm. which is a big part of the piece. Mm -hmm. uh, did you know? That uh, there could there are things that are not banned controlled substances that can be called analogs of banned controlled substances, depending on whether or not uh, the person in law enforcement decides that day that they are similar enough to a controlled substance. Um, so that is she. There was I did not know that. Yeah, that's a that's a big uh, that's a big holy shit moment. Uh, so she, the federal charges were dropped entirely. The charges against her sister were dropped. She had to plead guilty to uh, one uh, charge of. Uh, Controlled, uh, possession of controlled substance relating to these analogs from a previous raid. Again, these are not substances that were banned in the state of Texas at the time they were seized. Um, it's a deferred adjudication, meaning there is no guilty verdict, even though she's been pl she pled guilty. She is not a felon. She has not been convicted of anything, but the deferred adjudication means she gets to leave town, she completes a probationary period, and the whole thing just goes away. But the district attorney... Um, uh, reacted strongly to this piece, as you might imagine, and uh, in, a, in a statement written on his own office's letterhead, repeatedly called her a felon and didn't even get the basic facts of the case he was prosecuting right. So he's in a snit, and she uh, she actually just left town. Uh, she moved back to Houston um, after spending 11 years in Alpine. Yeah, that sounds like uh, the kind of town to leave after all of that bullshit. Yeah, I don't um, think I'll be visiting again soon. There were some great people, but I imagine uh, they'd be... They'd, there might be checkpoints. The um, the synthetic thing interests me because I mean, in classic government fashion, like they, you know, weed. I guess you often it's it's supposed to be a replacement for weed. Weed was banned, and so a worse, more unpredictable substance that is more um, chemical was invented that you know occasionally apparently causes people to flip their shit and go crazy in a way that only happens with weed if we're talking reefer madness. I so, mean, people, I have smoke, people have been smoking banana peels for, for when, when you run out of weed and you, and, the, and you can't scrape any last drop of resin out of your pipe. Like, people do stupid things like smoke banana peels. I'm proud to say that I didn't. But <laughs> friends of mine in my, in my own house uh, tried it, and I was like, that smells awful. You're going to throw up. And that's exactly what happened. Um, so, uh, yeah, like you said, prohibition has led to people experimenting with altering their state uh, with more unpredictable, um, possibly more toxic stuff. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the idea that you could be charged with a felony for possessing a substance that you've gotten, you've spent thousands of dollars to get tested to make sure doesn't contain any banned substances is pretty chilling. Subjective uh, law enforcement. Yeah, and I mean, I think a lot of my, you know, I know Carell and Joe can, like, start chiming. Y'all didn't need to be so quiet. Um, the thing about your story that freaked me out was was this kind of, like, not just the raid, because God knows I'm, I'm trying to be what I am about raids and stuff, but it was, you know, this the impeding on the speech and the basically, you know, pressuring her to... Pressuring all these criticisms to go away, like the guy who took the photos, you know, oh, you, that's not, your photos don't show what you 
took photos of. I mean, there's just... Yeah, the, district, the district attorney uh, told the guy to uh, take the photos off of Facebook because they were misleading photographs of the aftermath <laughs> of the raid. But the photographs were misleading. Um, and uh, and that's that, that's the thing. Like to me, like I I try not to be an obnoxious, elitist, urbane, East Coast, uh, you know, jerk. But uh, I've never I couldn't imagine in this day and age, you know, in the internet age, that even in a small town, that the intimacy of everybody knowing your business and the power of just a couple, like a handful of people in charge, to intimidate everybody, including the press. Uh, I just I didn't believe would be was possible, but uh, it's very possible. And um, like I said, it doesn't reflect on everybody in that town. It's, it's actually a really beautiful town in the foothills of the Davis Mountains. But, um, yeah, scary stuff. Scary stuff. Well, it was a good piece. Um, you should be depressed and proud of, of the work you did. I, uh, I try yeah. to be a little of both every day. <laughs> now, um, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> time. It, it says that if she violates any terms of pro probation, she can get five to life. Uh, I mean, could that just be like anything? Like what I don't, What all does her probation entail? I mean, uh, she's not allowed to drink alcohol. She's not allowed to... Uh, what does that have to do with anything? She's not allowed to own weapons, uh, which is a big deal uh, in Texas. Because, yeah. especially, I mean, primarily because uh, she owns is a rancher and owns horses and chickens and stuff like that, and there are predators out there which people shoot off, you know, off of their property. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, she there, there's a lot of petty bullshit that she has to follow. Um, you know, certainly she can't, you know, be, you know, get into any major, you know, like I mean, she might be able to get a traffic ticket, but certainly, uh, you know, not a DUI or anything like that. So yeah, so it's basically, she her whole life is, you know, ruined. She can't. I mean, it would be hard to be a rancher, I would assume, with no access to firearms and, you know. So basically, the, the cops just come so in, ruin not her a life. Felon, but she can't have a gun for some right. reason. Yeah. Which, yeah, that still doesn't make any sense to me. Strangely if, if personal. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess no it's not strangely personal you. because we, yeah. But I, I like the, uh, the analog, I don't like the analog thing. I think that's fascinating. It's almost like, um, it's like the obscenity laws kind of thing. It's like somebody saying, I know when I see it and I know an illegal substance when I see it. And that's sort of a, I mean, I, this is a, this is a local thing, right? Or this is a local DEA, the, the, the analog thing? Or is that like well, the federal well, law well, allows that? No, I mean, it's the, the analog law it was uh, passed in 1986, um, and that's, that's, my, that's, my, that's my point here, is that, like, you know, um, I'm, I'm, say, like, it, it, I'm saying that I do believe that uh, this law could be abused uh, by somebody with a, with, a, with a vendetta, and I believe it has been in this case. I well, believe it could be, yeah. theoretically. I mean, yeah, the, 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 so uh, the, uh, it's a federal law, but it can be applied locally. That's the magic of the DEA for you. Can't wait for that to be applied federally. That'll be. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, the synthetic crackdown. I mean, I just like if if you don't, none of this makes sense. I mean, with well, here's the thing. Here's 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 like I keep I, I this might not have gotten through, but I am kind of I really want to drive home the point that the Obama administration's DEA were witless chumps and pawns in one small town district attorney's personal vendetta. They, the, the DEA was in charge of this raid as part of the day of raids, but I'm, I surmise that the primary reason that they raided this store is, I mean, first of all, the, the DEA market, you get a federal warrant anytime they want. They came in with a Brewster County warrant that was ordered by the district attorney, uh, which is, from what I understand, a very rare thing. Um, and again, if, you, if you've got a day of raids, if you're raiding 200 places around the country, why can't you get your own warrant? Why can't you, you know? Um, so right. the, the district attorney was so desperate to find more samples to test to prove that she was guilty that he, he uh, and he had even, like I even mentioned in the piece, he had been turned down by his own county court um, uh, board of commissioners for more, for thousands of more dollars in lab tests. And so he was like, hmm, what can I do? Oh, the DEA is doing this raid. <laughs> hey, I know, I know a place you could hit locally. And the DEA yeah, I mean, was all too happy to go along with it. Yeah, calling them chumps and like paxies certainly get, you know lets them off a little too easy because I'm sure they were champing at the bit for uh, more fun. But uh, that is that is an interesting uh, 
chain of events and like chain of law enforcement that it was. Yeah, everyone, go look at the story. Um, yes, I got sure to uh, Google. Uh, yeah, sex, spice, and small town Texas justice. We need uh, eyeballs on that, please. We're gonna let you. Okay, we're gonna put the link up, and um, the end of the sh- podcast is all about promoting yourself. But yeah. uh, we're gonna move on. I'm gonna try to be decisive, as Joe always tells me to be, and I like to do what Joe says. Wait a minute. Um, we can talk about Rand Paul next, or we can talk about how the kids today love the socialism. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's get my, get my lower third working. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I don't know, know where it went. You had it and it was gone. Whatever. All right, so Reason Group, you know, keeping our reasony theme right now. Um, they, they did a big poll, and I, I didn't ever get a chance to look in depth, but I did note that 43% of millennials, or rather 18 to 29 year olds, so sort of at the older end of millennials, had a positive uh, impression of socialism. And, um, Oh, what was it? Emily Eatkins. I wrote down a quote. The closer you get in, uh, well, I, I, my my handwriting is horrible. Um, the older you get, the more you hate socialism, basically. So younger people who right. are adult and I suppose sensibly politically aware, they don't have the bad impression of socialism that we might wish. Um, there was also something about how they had a more positive impression of socialism than of a. Um, God almighty, I should write these things down. Yeah. And basically, like, it's not a planned economy, but a similar but more uh, banal-sounding thing, you know, because obviously we have a mixed economy in, in the United States. So like, the, the, the socialism, the kids and the socialism. Um, it reminds me of... Oh, go ahead. No, that's, 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 my, that's how I ask questions. That's your cue. Oh, yeah. That's your cue. <laughs> oh, that, that when I read that, the poll, it reminded me of... Um, in college, there was a friend of mine who is a, not a I, I don't know what major he was. It was something where you'd expect him to be a little smarter. It wasn't, you know, communication. Sorry to anybody who's communications. But, right uh, here. I'm he right said, here, Andrew. Yeah. Well, that's why you're you. No. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and he said to me something along the lines of, um, and this is a really offhanded comment he made, but he said something along the lines of, um, you know, I share my we with everybody. I'm a socialist. And that to That's me clearly is like, what that is, yeah. Right. Like, there's a, a fundamental misunderstanding on the difference between that and use of government force. And, like, so you're just saying you're a generous guy, really, is what you're saying. But I think that is sort of representative of how a lot of people who don't really remember maybe the wall falling, don't remember the Cold War. I mean, I, I grew up with a negative connotation of socialism because I was reading Hayek when I was, like, 15. But most people are not going <laughs> to know that. And they, so right I, I do think that, you know, there might be something about kids these days. But I think it's the same old adage that... Um, you know, you're a socialist until you, until the government takes your paycheck. Well, that's the thing. They don't even they 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 misunderstand. They completely misunderstand what socialism is. They say, yeah, we want more government programs and we want more uh, less income inequality. But when asked, okay, do you think the government should be running Apple? They go, no, of course not. That's ridiculous. But they don't right. understand that that's they, that there are no private companies in in socialism. So, it's like the rampant misuse of the word fascist, too. There's a lot of that exactly, going on. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole I mean, there's some flexible meanings. I mean, you know, there's there's like what Marx thought about X, Y, and Z, and there's what Shell and Richmond thinks about X, Y, and Z. And right, the, luckily, the Marxism is not a colloquial term we're using. Like, oh, that's so Marxist, man. Uh, oh, bro, it's so Marxist. I'm sure my but, I mean, I, everybody. I, I'm a Marxist. <laughs> I find the uh, socialism and generosity to be deeply just. Dis- now I don't remember the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall either. I wish I did. I was two at the time, and like I watched footage of it. I'm just like, <laughs> like I can't be cynical about that at all. Um, and like I'm actually like- old enough to remember uh, Tiananmen Square and the Berlin Wall, uh, and uh, and. Uh, that I think very. I mean, I'm 35 now, so I was 10 when both of those things happened. And very few people, even my age, like talk about it, consider it a major moment. Like it's 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 kind of just like the Cold War was like a bunch of John Le Carre no- novels, and so you know, and, and, and it just kind of, it happened, and then it just went away, and that was it. You know, there's there's very little reflection on that. Well, I think what we need is like another East Germany kind of. I mean, North Korea, it's it's kind of far out there. Cuba is kind of out of the the mainstream eye. We need like a an actual country dealing with socialism for, you know, some of these college kids, you know, I'm at the end of the millennial spectrum, 
and you know there, I've you don't see socialism related to in a bad way kind of in an everyday sense anymore. Yeah, Even no. if you go is, to college, is college the problem? Like it's got to be part of the problem. I had a bunch of socialist professors in college, and I was political science, so you know, yeah. there's a lot. Of, I mean, even if it's not positive about socialism so much, it's so much negativity about capitalism and kind of free enterprise now. I think that definitely doesn't help. Yeah, that's. I mean, Joe and I, um, our father in. Um, endearingly called us commies growing up, but like it wasn't, That's... not in like a Marxist, like a, like an insulting but endearing type of thing. It was, it was I mean, cute like... when he did it, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I thought it was like a referencing to the fact that you're not, I don't I, I, I was called, when I worked for Stossel, the whole Stossel team called me a commie libertarian because I'm very socially liberal, I guess. I, am, I, I don't know how, but how that makes any sense. But yeah, there's this sort it, of kind of really doesn't. No. That, that sort of fits in with this. Is like there's this idea that being slightly left on something makes you socialist in it or communist. It's like, well, no. Well, the whole point of libertarianism <laughs> is that you're left and right. Um, right. <laughs> you're you're, you're, you're the non-conflicting with itself bullshit version of things. Right. Um, not to uh, toot our ideological horn, but also to do so. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a whole big thing there with, like, you know, uh, you know, uh, Anthony's boss, Gillespie, and Welsh, and all those people. Their whole, li it's a libertarian moment type thing, which I always, like, bless their hearts, I always thought it was a little optimistic. Um, but, like, they often base it on these kinds of uh, reason group polls, and Anthony was saying, like, like there's no aversion to the word itself, socialism, but if you get down to more specific questions, there is more of a reason for optimism, like, no, I don't want to nationalize Apple. I mean, that's either, like, a reason to be positive, or it's just, like, part of the epic cluelessness of, you know, people I know who I like, but they're idiots, people who are writing on their tumblers about how they hate uh, capitalism, you know? Like, there's, like, a total cluelessness about about anything, until, I don't know. Well, I can't I mean, decide about the optimism. There's some nuance in there in the sense that, like, maybe hating the concept of capitalism, but, and because they may conflate it with crony capitalism, that's maybe not such a terrible thing. Like, that's why there's some, some overlap between... Too much credit. That's giving them way too much credit, I know, but I'm saying that, that that's like a, a, that's sort of a... It's like a um, it's a it's an in for us as the sort of annoying missionaries. Like, have you read Hayek before? And, you know, like we can be like, well, did you know that capitalism isn't actually capital? You know, like that's the in for us. Uh, yeah. That's sort of how I approach it. Is, is yeah, capitalism may be an evil in the sense that capitalism as we know it is state capitalism, and that's something that maybe is not such a great thing. And then, but then you say to these people, they don't like capitalism, but they want Apple to be to have its own autonomy. That's like, yeah, exactly. That that's what capitalism should be. Is there shouldn't be no sort of um, you know, almost intimate relationship between government and business, but these businesses should be able to do what they want and create the sort of progress that you want. You're, a lot of these people oppose SOPA, so they're on the right track. It's just they don't quite. Well, I, I generally try to set my, my selling point is um, uh, because I, you know, I'll probably get kicked out of most libertarian salons for saying that I do actually think there's a place for uh, public roads and and some public works and yeah I know am I know have I already have you already cut off my uh, my uh, <laughs> um, so, I, yeah, so I uh, so I, I generally sell uh, uh, capitalism or at least free market economics to uh, self-avowed socialists or communists by saying yeah you know your government cheese is a very nice you know you can feel good about yourself that you give government cheese. But what would be great is if you like took stupid, pointless, protectionist barriers to entry uh, to either employment or opening a business uh, away to let people who uh, might be dis financially disadvantaged make their own way and compete and work for something and uh, make a profit and make more money than they're going to make on the dole. And and it's like you know I'm not saying get rid of all of the. Uh, uh, the social safety net. I think I think the social safety safety net would be stronger and more robust if a lot of the uh, protectionisms that keep poor people uh, from uh, gaining an entry to business were removed. And then they go, yeah, but that's uh, no man. Like you know, the cat, you know, Uber, Uber, fuck Uber, man. Yeah, yeah. the new uh, Uber hatred is fascinating. 
I was waiting for them to all be touting like the Ebola guy took an Uber. Ergo, like it's all Uber's fault. Um, yeah, and, and that, speaking of the, uh, just uh, real quick, since since we're so topical, uh, I don't, the, the, the new the new thing now this is in the 24 hours since uh, Dr. Spencer tested positive for Ebola, uh, they're they're now tracing his path. Uh, in the day that he first got a fever, as if like, what the hell is that going to do? Like, are, are, unless you know everybody who took that path too, like everybody that was on the high line, everybody that was on the L train, everybody that you know took that Uber, like, it, it's it's. I guess it's just you know we're we're down to like infection porn phase. <laughs> a yeah. bit, yeah. 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 Don't, like, don't, don't lick anything on your travels. Now I'm a little worried about you, New Yorkers. Don't just don't lick anything. Unless, yeah, that was fantastic. That thing that uh, I think that was on media, right, Andrew? The uh, the guy in, in New York one saying, "If you find feces, don't eat it." He's, he's like, "It's, <laughs> it's the, the simplest advice I can give is if you find strange mucus or poop on the street, just don't eat it." It's like, well, yeah. that's you a good New York thing later, thing later, in general. I mean, that's yeah. solid. That's fine in theory, but <laughs> I mean, you know, what if, some people like to toss salad, and you don't know what you know the possibilities are there. But. No, dude, dude. This is a family show. It's not done. Don't worry. <laughs> Nobody knows what that means. No. Well, yeah. Anyway. Do you want to talk about Rand Paul? How about Rand Paul? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the kids today. Oh, I was going to say one more thing, even though I, I could have let you steal the segue there. But... For a comedic... Andrew, effect. whatever the hell yeah. your name is. Andrew Carell, that's the one. Um, your mention of you know cronyism and stuff. I've noticed that I've met a lot of left libertarians lately, and like you're not one. They're more left. They feel like they're part of the left. And yeah, no, I don't. I don't identify as that. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't either. Even though I've been accused of such, but I'm even a they, libertarian. E even <laughs> they admit that like okay, if what we have is state capitalism, you know, we've been freer. We have you know the laptops on which we are now using to converse. Um, state capitalism is clearly better than state socialism or communism or, or fascism, obviously. So, like, if the world was as, like, nice as Republicans think it is and if the market was purely free and magical, it would be a lot easier to convince people of this. Um, we have to be all like, well, the market's not free exactly, but it's kind of free and that's kind of why you have this sweet phone that you like and stuff. The problem, so, though, that I have with... I have a problem with a lot of people in our sort of small world libertarian camp is like the sort of fetishization of, you know, well, just free the markets. And I, I agree that's the prescription for most things. It's just what we don't really convey when we say that is that there will still be problems. Like, people will still suffer. Uh, it's just more optimal. But I think the pe that, that is sort of the, the thing that frustrates me a lot about Republicans when they talk economics is they talk a lot about freeing the markets and free enterprise and this worship of business. And... They but do they also imply that. that we have a free market already, like entirely. That, that but they also time. imply that it's magic and it'll just fix everything. But it's it's not it's not that's not what we think. We think it's just it is a better alternative, and it's also it is more just. You know, people who are, who suffer. You know, there are people who are not who are not as successful. That's more just outcome. Um, and also, we recognize that that there's no perfect system. Like that, that that's a problem I think with Republicans when they talk about this. Is they talk about it in such a magic way that it makes it makes any talk of free markets make you look like a fool now. Where if you say free markets in public, people think, well, you're just like a, you know, as Jeffrey Sachs called it, a market fundamentalist. Hmm. Like you believe in this religious hand or something. Like the markets are a religion almost. And I well, I mean, I think that there's a lot of straw manning from liberals about. The way libertarians talk about it, but it's true that like sure. the yeah. sophistication and nuance is sometimes lacking. Basically, I'm saying um, the mainstream but, right makes us look bad because they don't know how to talk about money. They, <laughs> they always do, don't they? Yeah. Well, they also make it. They also make uh, you know, us, whoever us are, look bad uh, you mean by not practicing. Yeah, sorry. Go yeah, but not practicing uh, any of this when they're in office. I mean, like, do you, do you, you know, is there? You know, are are there really any liber? I mean, pardon me, Republican uh, heroes out there in Congress who you know vote against you know pork barrel projects in their uh, districts? Are there who like? I mean, you know, other you know, Ron Paul's retired now, and Amash? even he wasn't perfect. Amash, he wasn't even perfect. Yeah. Amash is very good, but he's not perfect either. Yeah, you know? like, I mean, he's he's probably your best example. They have a job right now. Three hundred more Republicans in Congress besides Amash. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, that's a decent enough segue to get to our next. Thank you for that, Anthony. To Not our the next one before, question. That wasn't <laughs> what now? Nothing. Go ahead. What are you? Are you sassing me, Corral? Are you sassing me? You need an ombudsman on this show, I think. We need to bring yeah. that back. Yeah. I'm trying to get Joe to do that, but he's too lazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or my other friends that seem to have wandered off, never to return to this podcast. They were terrible. It's fine. I'm over it. They're bad people. I despise them. Okay, lost the segue there. Um, speaking of Republicans in Congress who are mixed but kind of libertarian, Rand Paul, a couple days ago, did what is being touted as his big deal foreign policy speech. And um, some Vox dude thinks it's a really big deal. And Connor Friedrichsdorf kind of thought, uh, check out the speech at all. And do you have any thoughts? I can, I can kind of fill you in if you missed it. About the <laughs> Are we talking about the actual speech, the words of the speech? Well, I mean, uh, it, what it means for America. I mean, what does it mean for America, Joe? What do they mean for America? I mean, he yeah. seems to be basically laying out his plan. That I mean, he kind of uses the normal wishy-washy kind of words, where you know, it's, war is necessary when America is attacked or threatened, when vital American interests are attacked and threatened, and we've exhausted all other measures short of war. You know, that's so. What does that really mean? You know, it's it sounds good, and well, the the big thing is he said he he's talking bringing Congress back, and uh, like that's pretty revolutionary at this point. That yeah. uh, and that and that's that's horrible. That that is a big deal. But yeah, no, but it is. I mean, I mean, you're right that it's horrible. But let's be honest about it. It's a fucking big deal. We haven't declared war since World War Two, and we've been at war. Since World War Two, and uh, this is a you know popular leading potential Republican candidate who's saying we won't do this unless we go to Congress. Now, to be fair, the current you know, Nobel Peace Prize winner in chief said the same thing and then didn't do it. Yep. But uh, it was less controversial for him to do that in the Democratic primary than it is for Ron Rand Paul to do it in a Republican primary. Yeah, I mean, the Obama thing is exactly what I worry about. Usually, when I'm excited, but any politician doing anything to provoke any type of optimism about politicians. I either think Obama, like I don't want to be those idiots I saw in 2008, like literally chanting his name in the streets. No, I doubt him. you were, but we all had reason to expect he wouldn't be as terrible as he's been. Let's be honest. Right. Yeah. 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 It's true. Um, but like the level of, 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 of optimism about a politician is, is fundamentally bad. But at the same time, libertarians always shoot themselves in the foot and are overly purist. But at the same fucking time, Ronald Reagan, you know, is still talked of, um, including by Rand Paul um, recently, as some sort of libertarian, like, and he, and for the drug war alone, dude, like, to, to hell with Reagan. Like, he was not, he read the Freeman on an airplane once and someone took a picture of him. Like, that's, that's all. Yeah, and then that ghost is still there in the sense that Grover Norquist saw, I think he was at the New York speech, this speech that everybody's been hyping up, and Grover Norquist saw the speech and he sort of channeled John Landau when he first saw Bruce Springsteen and uh, in saying, I've seen the future of rock and roll, and it's Bruce Springsteen. And in this case, Grover Norquist actually said to the press that he has seen, he's seen the new Reagan. Or I, th I forget the exact quote. We wrote it up on media. It was, uh, I've seen the new Reagan, and, and it is, and it is, that guy is Rand Paul. And in a sense, maybe that's, um, maybe he doesn't mean it literally. Maybe he means it in the sense of somebody who can galvanize the Republican Party to actually get its shit together. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I don't get it at all. I mean, I mean, I mean, Reagan was like Reagan was like Bill Clinton, a master campaigner. More than yeah. like, more, yeah. like more than there was ever any substance in either of their presidencies. It was all about an image, an image that made people feel good. You know, they'd also, you know, the people that hated them, you know, viscerally hated them. But, Incredibly. Uh, you know, like Reagan was inscrutable even to his family and his closest friends. You know, and and Rand Paul is prone to clumsy mistakes, short temper, um, and it remains to be seen what a what a what a national candidate he'll be. Like yeah. I mean he can't he can't run to us and win the, the presidency or even the Republican nomination. Like he needs to, you know, find his inner uh, warmth or, or, or you know something that connects generally with people. I, mean, I don't know that he can do it. I think it's gonna be some, you know, some schmuck like Huckabee who like walks oh in with God. a sweater, you know. Oh that's no, I, I think when it comes down to 
<laughs> that's what the GOP wants. That's such a that's, huggable that, fashion. That's proven to be like, wrong. Rand Paul, Rand Paul has the potential to, to make some waves, and, and, I, and I hope he runs, and I hope it's a bloody, knockdown, fucking, you know, scorched earth battle, mm. but uh, I, I just don't see it. I don't see him run it, going the distance without seriously fucking himself up, and let's not, you know, make light of, you know, the uh, Confederate uh, groupies that he uh, have been in his employ, you know, like, this kind of shit will matter on a national stage. There's that, and then there's also the fact that it's, as I've been, I mean, I've been saying this a lot, it's like, you know, even if you, I wanted to be a Rand Paul optimist, I'm sure Justin Romando would kill me for saying I'm a Rand Paul pessimist, but... Uh, <laughs> there's always a reason for Justin to be <laughs> yeah, about but, uh, it's fine. I'm it's pessimistic in the sense that I'm, and not even just because I disagree with Rand on some things, and I think his message is a little, uh, he, in terms of, like, you know, eighth grade me talking about punk rock, I'd be like, he sold out. But, um, you know, but Rand Paul, for me, I think what's going to happen if he were to ever get the nomination of the Republican Party is, is really obvious to me, is the right will eat him alive, and the left, will, not, even, not even if he gets the nomination, before he ever gets the nomination, the right will eat him alive during the debates because there is a mood on the right, I think, for interventionism. Although it seems like there isn't, like there's been this sort of wave because Obama's president, there really is this creeping sort of I wouldn't call it neo neoconservatism. It's just this general idea we got to go get the we got to go get them, um, and then and also because there's people like Bill Crystal who are scaremongering about him being the you know the the end of Western civilization in some sense. And Bill Crystal's the, the fucking end of Western civilization as well. Yes, yeah. uh, but then as soon as the left detects that he may have a chance at this, they're going to eat him alive too. I mean they they love him right now, and there's there's a lot of there's a lot of like. So, lack of a better word, there's synergy right now. I mean, there's there's Eric Holder praising Rand Paul. There's, mm -hmm. you know, he's he's citing the new Jim Crow, that awesome book about how the drug war is basically the new Jim Crow. He's citing that book during his speeches. And he's speaking at Howard University. And he's going to Ferguson and doing meet and greets with local leaders, which nobody else has done. I don't think even the president came and did that. Um, nobody else from the no, no possible Democratic contender has done that. No possible Republican contender has done that. So he's doing all this outreach. But it's going to backfire, I think, because once the left detects that he is a possibility to defeat whoever their nominee is, whether it's Clinton, Cuomo, Warren, or whoever, um, or that he's somebody that will go up against them, they, the machine will churn and they will turn on him. And then you'll see a rehashing of the Rachel Maddow interview, and you'll see questions about how he's reacting to this Ebola stuff. I mean, this is, that, that's not major enough, but like you know, there's a general sort of tone, as Anthony was hinting at, with Rand, where he has this tendency to just speak off the cuff in the same way that his father does, that is sometimes counterproductive. So practically, I mean, the, there are sorry, they, there, John McCain has already hinted that he would prefer President Hillary Clinton to President yep. Rand Paul. I uh, remember this, yes. And and Joan Walsh, I even got into it with her on Twitter because she was snarking about um, Rand Paul's uh, the statement that he made. Uh, he was in. Central America when Ferguson was was blowing up and he he was like the first you know national figure to to make a you know a, a really forceful statement about police militarization and she, and Joan Walsh was snarking about it on Twitter and I was like hey you know can you time out how about like a moment you know where a you know why you know a popular nationally known Republican senator is making a statement against police militarization in the post 11 world how about like just one moment where you can say that that's a good thing. And to you know, to her credit, she was very candid. She said, "I do give him credit for that, but that's why he scares me more than any other Republican politician." Like she, like, mm -hmm. she, she, like the salon world already, already like he is the, the 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 target is on on him right now. Even even if like you know he's he's kissy face with Eric Holder, like they do actually see. You know, I don't see Rand Paul like you know doing whipping up the crazy college kids the way Ron did. But the uh, at the same There's time, there's a little Ron slow burn incredible. about it. It's not he. The enthusiasm isn't there, but there's there's an element of that. Um, if he, if just, he comes out for decriminalizing or legalizing weed, I think he'll secure the college vote a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> the first national politician to do that that would be huge. But. And I forget that he's he hasn't actually way. done that, but he kind of did. He hinted that he's in favor of decriminalizing, but it's, you know. It's, well, I mean, that's the thing, though. Like, the, the, God knows the pragmatic reasons or the practical reasons for pessimism are one thing, but I'm not getting a lot of ideological pessimism because you guys, I guess, are more sensible than that. Um, yeah, I disagree with them on a lot of stuff, but I think, you know, as a person who is the first, this is the first time where I actually feel like a guy who represents my views in, like, the 
smallest amount is going to get more than like one caucus vote in Maine, which is what Ron Paul, what Ron Paul got last in 2012. I think he got he got the Maine primary or something like this. Yeah. This could be actually big. But I really, I really genuinely believe, and I know he's a clown, but I genuinely believe that like Ben Carson is more what the Republicans, what the Republican base truly wants. If you go on Twitter and just talk, to, I know this is, you know, it's, it's not fair to base Republicans off Twitter, but <laughs> you go on Twitter and talk to a lot of like conservative writers who are in this business of sort of churning out the machine of who's who's the conservative du jour, and they really do like people like Ben Carson, and it's kind of baffling. It's just. I really don't. I think they'll, they will. I honestly believe they will eat Rand Paul alive because they'd prefer somebody like Ted Cruz, who's a total opportunist. Well, I mean, it's, 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 we're getting very, very close to to. I mean, right after the midterms is when this shit's going to get real. Yeah. And uh, and yeah. uh, it and depending, like, I mean, remember how? I mean, the Republicans already said that they're not going to allow what happened last time. They're not going to allow 13 months of debates, sure. even though that was awesome. Right? That was like yeah, I, I watched I mean, almost every single. You and, I, and Lucy, you and I, even, you know, stayed up drinking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it was a. Uh, I, I remember at the Reason DC office watching one of those uh, early Republican debates with like ten candidates, and it was just a total yeah. fiasco. Um, it was but, great. but but still, it, you had you had great you had great moments where like uh, Ron Paul calls Rick Santorum a phony to his face, yeah. you know? um, and uh, you know uh, Romney, like when given one word to describe himself, says resolute, you know. Like, <laughs> got to see like the id of all these uh, you know Republican would be presidential candidates and like um, I to, con to contrast like the just bullshit of a, of a, of a you know the RNC and the uh, uh, DNC uh, the when when you have these like bloody nosed free for all debates with ten candidates on them you have like six or seven of them that's when you actually really do get to see the soul of the party and and it's that very reason they're not going to do that again. Yeah. There is no soul. <laughs> <laughs> well, any, I mean, like, Ron Paul did change, he changed the debates in that he made people remember, like, the Fed is a thing, and they should probably robotically form the words that say they were maybe against it or for auditing it. And there was even, like, an occasional sprinkling of, like, foreign policy nuance, maybe. Yeah. But then and the Rand Paul's... Um, Drone filibuster, you had all of those, you know, barnacles clinging to him, Ted Cruz, and even more, like, transparently just fraudulent Marco Rubio coming down like a robot. Yeah. I am for Rand Paul. This is, yes, me, He didn't Marco even say Rubio. he was for the cause. He was just, I support Rand Paul. Because <laughs> he, he didn't for... want to nominate the guy is what it was. He didn't want to nominate Brennan, I guess it was, right? Yeah. yeah. I, hate I just, I don't yeah, think he has a base. That's the problem. I mean, he'll never, I don't think he'll get far in the primaries. Well, it's too fractured almost. I mean, that, you have that's what it is. It's not, it's not going to be the voters who are going to actually go vote in these primaries. Those aren't his, you know, if he's going to Ferguson and doing all this kind of, you know, talking to Howard University, that's not something, you know, the Republican base is going to really care about. You right, know? grudging respect from liberals, like, I don't see right, that gonna, bringing you uh, the presidency. Like, oh, he seems okay on a few issues. Well, ready for Hillary. Right. Well, that's, the thing, that's the thing about, yeah, exactly. And that's sort of what Anthony was mentioning Joan Walsh before. Is like That's exactly how I think a lot of them feel is this sort of tepid enthusiasm that there's a guy like this, but they're also amused. And I think that they're ready on a dime to turn on him and say, it was all disingenuous, he's just a Republican fascist. Um, you know, I've, I've, Confederacy, civil rights to that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, that, and you know, just the fact that he is anti-abortion, and he is, um, you know, he hasn't. He's been incredibly wishy-washy on gay marriage to the point where it's frustrating because nobody knows exactly what he thinks. Uh, that kind of stuff will will hurt him, especially now as more. Hey, and gay more. marriage is even going to be an issue. Like, I, 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 I'm pretty sure like it's over. Even though the... Michelle Bachman, who I know is retiring from Congress. Literally said, uh, "I'm bored with talking about gay marriage." And, Good for her. Fine. And, and now that we're over thirty some odd states, I think it's kind of over. I don't see it being a campaign issue. It might be red. Meat. It might be red meat that they throw, but it's not going to be an issue. That's what I mean. Is like it'll be red meat in the in the debates in the sense where they'll throw it out as like a bellwether for whether you're still a true conservative who believes in values regardless of whether the country has changed. And that's I think they're they're, they're still going to cling on to that for one more election cycle. I think. That's yeah, cool. that's it's, yeah. And he's going to have to you know he's going to have to target some of those conservative voters. And you know as soon as he makes that pivot, 
you know, if he somehow magically gets a nomination, all the things that he said in those, you know, debates to in all Iowa, those, yeah, right, are immediately going to be, you know, like you said, just fodder for the left to just unload on him. But that's, I think, that's wishful thinking. Even that he'll make it that far. Yeah, I've never heard him this pessimistic about well, Rand Paul. I mean, like, I mean, like, Rand, like ages. Sorry, go on. Well, I was just saying, like, I mean, I know, like, you know, we're at the stage where nobody's even declared yet, and like, you know, the usual suspects are Cruz, Rubio, Paul Ryan, Christie, Scott Black, Walker, like, Jeb Bush, John Walker, Jeb Bush. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, like, I mean, there's a there there are you know, booby traps for all of those guys, you know. Um, I actually do ultimately think it's going to be Bush and Clinton. Like that's, Are that's, you serious? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I, it's going to be so I, good in, like, a watch-the-world-burn kind of way if it's... If it's no, it'll, you know, it'll be... You know what that is? That's that's when we all just give up. That's, like, soil and green. Right. Just like, I'll just it's, laugh it's about yeah, yeah. everything and just be yeah, like, yeah. well... Fuck America, we're done. You say yeah. that now. Like, we're an oligarchy. Woo! Sorry, That's when we use our Canadian citizenship, Lucy. Yes, we do. We, still, we can still get out. That's why I'm moving to Paris. <laughs> See you guys in hell. I mean, you can move so, to Canada, but, socialist, socialist paradise, and uh, yeah, guard the war memorial. Yeah. Yeah. Former oh. yeah. yeah. socialist paradise. And even our Montana stronghold is is technically owned by the federal government, Joe. So we're kind of out of luck there too. Oh. Alberta, Lucy. Alberta. All right, that's where we'll go, Joe. Right after this podcast, I'll meet you. Greatest there. economy in North America. <laughs> just, just feel, just feel lucky that under both of those people that you're living here, at least, and not living in a country that is majority brown people, because you know you'll likely be bombed under those presidencies. So, not that it's, it's any different now. I don't know why it's any different now, but um, I, I mean, yeah, I, a- I've heard rumors that Hillary's not going to run, but uh, oh, that I would be great because people would be so. Like oh wait we need to. I I, I I just do not to me like Hillary like her entire life has led up to this like basically. Yeah, this is <laughs> it. And, and she did, and and I don't even think I don't even think she believed she was going to get a second shot. I really don't. Like I think that uh, you know that one term as Secretary of State was something that she wasn't expecting, and somebody tipped her off that like no this is your way back in, and you know you don't have to do nobody does it for two terms or you know unless you're Henry Kissinger. Uh, so you, you got a way out. You got a way to piss on the tent from the you know from the outside and say, hey, see, you should have voted for me in 2008 the whole time. I mean, as long as you know uh, the the rumors that Karl Rove seems hell bent on spreading about her aren't true and her health is you know good enough to run, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's no fucking way she's not running. All right, she's she's yeah. you know you put it with Bill Clinton for 40 years for this. <laughs> Hashtag Benghazi. <laughs> And the sexism is going to come in, and then the horrible, like, feet. Well, it's a lady's turn the to be an authoritarian yeah. scumbag hawk. Like, yeah, the, best part, the best part will be when the Saturday Night Live come out. Saturday Night Live won't be able to find a, an impressionist to do a Hillary impression, and when they do, it won't work, and they'll say, well, it's just because there's nothing funny about Hillary. There's nothing to make fun of. <laughs> well, but Amy, Amy Poehler was good at doing her, but Amy Poehler's not on the cast anymore, so it doesn't matter. But... It's another tragedy. Amy Poehler's awesome. Well, politics are horrible. Um, we didn't. I never. I didn't find us a nice uh, non-political topic, so we're just gonna do a nice other thing we do, which is where we talk a little bit about the exciting non-political thing we've enjoyed in the past week or so. Joe, share with the class, would you? Uh, hockey's back, so that's about all I care about. Hockey. For the next five months or so. So just hockey. For the next this five is months. Pittsburgh, Andrew. All right. Sorry. Sure. Care about sports and that's that's all. Literally <laughs> hockey. Literally <laughs> hockey. Um. Okay, hockey. Anthony, in your damn creaking chair, hold still, man. Uh, what have you enjoyed the past week or so that is not related to politics? Jesus, can you come back to me? Like, uh, uh, <laughs> Like so Jesus is. I'm putting you down for yeah. Jesus. Yeah, I'm going to watch a movie later, which might be the first movie I've watched in weeks. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, World but Series... But you haven't enjoyed that yet, though. Yeah, World Series is awesome. I don't know the sports thing. Um, you know, that's that's about it. I really I really don't have anything non-political that has happened that's been interesting in the past week. But if uh, if anything comes to me, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely chime in. Okay, uh, Carell. You should you? go. You, you should give yours, Lucy, and then we'll, we'll give ours. Oh, well... 
I'm trying to think. Well, all I have that comes to mind that's notable is that I wrote a review of a Charlie Parr show um, like a week or so ago, and then Charlie Parr show, shared it on his Facebook, and then my blog got lots of traffic, and then I was worried that I insulted him because I described him as really awkward on stage. <laughs> Um, so it was a roller coaster ride of emotions, but turns out he thought it was really funny, so it was okay. <laughs> that, actually was reminds, that actually reminds me, the, uh, and I don't care about any what any of you think, uh, I'm excited about the new and final Pink Floyd album that's coming out. Uh, I didn't know I, there was such a thing as new Pink Floyd albums. Honestly. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. From, the, from the sessions that they recorded 20 years ago from their last studio album, uh, they, you know, their keyboardist Rick Wright died in 2008, so this was basically their... Tribute to him. The album is almost entirely instrumental, except for the last song, which has some feeble words on it. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's coming out in a couple of weeks, and I'm actually going to buy that on a CD. I'm going to go wow. into a record store. I'm going to find a fucking record store. I'm going to mm -hmm. buy it on CD. And I've basically been doing the entire Pink Floyd canon, um, you know, from uh, '67 to '94. And so that's been that's been great because I've uh, it's uh, Pink Floyd was probably the like the band of my. Uh, of my high school uh, uh, experience, that uh, you know they were already an, an old band at that point, but I did get to see them live, and I've gotten to see some of their solo stuff uh, since then, and uh, uh, you know to, to have one more uh, hopefully better than nostalgic uh, album will be will be cool. You should also know that Roger Waters isn't on the album still. He had to clarify that he is no, he's not part of Pink Floyd. So. And I couldn't so. be happier about that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't really mock you for Pink Floyd. I just literally like two Pink Floyd songs. But I only know, like, four Pink Floyd songs, so I have no mocking. I mean, you're a damn hippie, and Johnny Rod disapproves, but, like, that's fine. Because you have terrible taste in music, Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I mean, what's ironic, what's ironic is that... Uh, yeah. It's awesome. What? Sorry. The, uh, the, the, the 1977 Brit punk slag, you know, uh, it definitely took direct aim at, like, bands like The Who and Pink Floyd. But for my money, uh, Pink Floyd's 1977 album, Animals, is, like, the angriest thing of the 70s. It's angrier than any, uh, you know, leather-clad punk uh, shit. It's, it's prog angry prog rock. Vicious. Calls and people out by name. The imagery is more lasting, I would say, too. That, the, 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 the pig... I mean, that's sort of... Oh, the pig, yeah, totally. Everyone the pig that. floating over a smokestack, I think that's like a sort of an image that has, will never go away. I was uh, like the guys on fire, then. I guess my past week enjoyment, actually, oddly enough, this isn't my answer, but funny enough, I've been listening to a lot of metal. Not the type of music, but the album. Anthony knows what I mean, the Pink Floyd album, Metal. Um, yes. Which... Uh, With two Ds. It's such an underrated album and how it's like, bizarrely a mix of like three different genres where there's one song where I think Richard Wright wrote it, uh, San Tropez, which is just this like sort of reggae uh, bizarre, like uh, tropical, I guess I would describe a tropical song, but then there's amazing songs like Echoes. Lucy, take notes. Um, <laughs> I'll take, I'll, right, I'll do it. Right. I mean, yeah, for, my, for my money, that's the best yeah. album. Like, I mean, to me, that's oh, the right. most I feel like you album. and I have talked about this before, but I guess I didn't realize that I was your, oh, well, that, that, might, that might be my favorite. I wish you were here. I don't know which one was my favorite album, but uh but uh, my, my answer album. for something that I yeah, the, the guy's shaking hands. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past week that I've enjoyed, there's this band uh, called Delta Spirit, and uh, oh, yeah. their new album. I, I've sort of like sour on them in the past couple of years. They're this sort of folk rockish, uh, garage rock, weird, uh, maybe a little bit of the band kind of thing going on. And they, I've kind of soured on them in the recent years, where I feel like they've become Kings of Leon-ish, where they're like trying to become this big Nashville overproduced sound. And I like Kings of Leon, even though I was. Supposed I hate to. them. I, I despise Kings of Leon, but there's like this. There, but there's this trend among bands like that, Americana, um, folk rock, garage rock bands, which I'm they, all about. But yeah, not. They, there's this trend where they they get they hook up with a with a, a really uh, expensive producer. Cold War Kids is a band that did this. They hook up with an expensive producer and they yeah, sort of awesome. churn out this really middling boring album that it sort of sacrifices what they were about, and that's what Delta Spirit did with the album before this, but this new album, Into the Wide, which I was a skeptic of originally, is um, it's big, it's grand, it has this sort of early Springsteen, not early Springsteen, maybe Born in the USA, sort of a, a, you know organ-churning overtures and, and lots of uh, layers of instrumentation, but it's, it's a beautiful record. It's, it's, uh, it's clearly a married man writing the songs because he's married now, so he's no longer bitching about you know, what he used to bitch about when he was a busker in San Diego. Um, a lot of the songs are about, you know, nature and being out in the wild, but it's a beautiful record, and I recommend checking it out. 
Someday um, we're going to need to have a, a wanky music nerd talk podcast because um, you that guys would, are so full of knowledge. Of I like that I... more than talking about Bill Crystal. We didn't talk. We didn't talk about oh. Bill Crystal. Carell, what's the name of the podcast? Politics for people who hate politics. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's the essence. The essence of it all. Um, it's exciting that even though I like talking to you guys because I never see you because you live in that stupid New York City place. Um, we should probably wrap up. <laughs> We've kept it to like about an hour, so if we wrap maybe up under an hour for maybe the first time in like in like four months. Fit. Yeah, definitely. Um, but let's uh, let you guys promote yourselves for the people. Um, Chio, do you have any promotional things to tell? Well, well my my band has an album coming out tomorrow, which is fun, and we got to be on the marquee at the Rex Theater with John Hodgman. So wow, about right. that. It's probably the best thing that's ever happened to me. Yay! Um, I'm going to go to the show tomorrow, and I'm telling yes. the parents to go. So You'll be, you'll be there taking photos, and it'll be great. I've yeah. literally never heard my brother's band play, which is super <laughs> terrible of me. Oh. <laughs> You've been around for three years. Yeah, you know, I know. It's terrible. I just followed you on Twitter, though. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that means a lot. <laughs> um, what, 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 by the way, what's your band called, Joe? I don't like to say it out loud. I hate the name. It's called Act of Pardon. Everybody hates their band name. Yeah, What's it called? Act, I know. Act of Pardon. They chose it before I got there. I don't it's know called Act of Pardon. Everyone look at it. Uh, that good. is terrible. But you do have to promote it, otherwise nobody's going to know what you're, that you're playing. And Nothing you know. is as terrible as Benjamin's. And Benjamin has gotten pretty good at music, Joe, but remember remember his hippie-ass name. That's just the I know. Thing There's else. so many yeah. bad band names in the world, you know. Like the Beatles? Let's remember that the, 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 like that the, worst, band, the worst band name is the uh, Dave Matthews Band. <laughs> That's not true at all, but it's still funny. It's a terrible name, yeah. Everybody hates their band name. Mogwai famously named themselves after the Gremlin or whatever in the movie, and then they're like, oh, we just don't have time to change it. Who cares? Whatever. <laughs> We've gone too far. Yeah, I, I, I heard that, uh, I heard that uh, Full Out Boy hates their name, and I couldn't be happier to hear that. But the Simpsons! Yeah. I mean, Jaden and Freud, right? That's yeah, I don't know what the Simpsons, but I, I, I like that they hate themselves. For doing well, that. Dude, we can do a whole <laughs> podcast theory, with Joe Simpsons and Fall Out Boy. Now yeah, we need still bands that like name themselves after books, like bands called like East of Eden and Of Mice and Men. They need to like admit how terrible their ideas were. But <laughs> there's a lot. Man. I actually knew a bunch of commies in my high school who called themselves Atlas Shrugged. Wow, <laughs> wow. all right, that's a, that's a little funny actually. I'm kind of like they, that. Wore, they wore Che Guevara shirts and, and played in a band called Atlas Shrugged. <laughs> all right, this isn't the band section. <laughs> A man named Sex. Oh my God! All right, um, Carell, what are you to promote yourself, son? Uh, go read Mediate, and uh, I'm speaking at the Students for Liberty New York Regional Conference in November. Nice. Um, I'm speaking at the Pittsburgh one, maybe. Yeah. Hopefully, I'm not listed yet, so I actually don't believe it's happening. No. <laughs> and uh, that's yeah. November fifteenth, right? November fifteenth. Yeah. Are yeah, you coming? Let's go to yeah. that, people. What? You're not coming. Never mind. Oh no, I'm I'm going to Pittsburgh one on the same day. Oh oh oh, they're all. Uh, I didn't realize that. A lot of them are on the same days. So yeah. Yeah. So delivery is good. Um, Anthony, what about you? Yeah, you can see uh, the uh, story we were talking about before, Sex Spice and Small Town Texas Justice on YouTube or Reason.com. Check out uh, the trailer for my feature film, Sidewalk Traffic, at sidewalktrafficmovie.com. It's coming to a uh, regional festival near you, hopefully. Stay tuned. But, uh, yeah, our, our pretty website and our pretty trailer is up there. And you can see me on Fox News' Red Eye on Monday, November 3rd. I think it's the 3rd. So, uh, You're so yeah. legitimate, Anthony. We're not even Chivo, doing that. Chivo, <laughs> your... <laughs> what did I do? What did I do, what did I do wrong? I said, you're so legitimate. What are you even doing here? <laughs> oh, it's be on Red Eye. And it's because I support Rhodes. Yeah. <laughs> it is why. Yeah. Damn you to hell. Like Gutfeld likes him. <laughs> <laughs> Gutfeld loves Rhodes. Bastard. <laughs> um, all right, we've got to wrap this shit up. Uh, Carell and Anthony and Joe, thank you all for joining me. Um, audience from the future. Um, thanks for watching. Uh, go look at liberty.me and join it if you have money because it's pretty cool. All right, see you next time. Bye.